and welcome to the 19th meeting of the Economy, Energy and Fair Work Committee for 2019. Um, the first item on the agenda is a decision by the committee to take items 4, 5 and 6 in private. Are we agreed? agreed. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is item 2, which relates to the Public Procurement Etc. Miscellaneous Amendments Scotland Regulations 2019, which is SSI 2019. 173. These regulations make minor corrections to the transposition of EU directives, which regulate the award of concession and utilities contracts. Does any member have any substantive issues they wish to raise, or are they content that the instrument comes into force? Uh, we are agreed then. Thank you. We now turn to item three in the agenda, which is our session today on the Scottish National Investment Bank Bill. And may I welcome our two witnesses today. Uh, first of all, Rob Hunter, who is Director of Strategy at the Development Bank of Wales, and also Kerry Sharp, who is Director of Scottish Investment Bank and Scottish Enterprise, at Scottish Enterprise, I think. Um, first of all, I wanted to ask, the, the British Business Bank has been in operation for about five years, and I think one of its goals was to change the structure of finance markets for smaller businesses in the UK. So I'm just wondering what the impact of its, its activity has been in Scotland and in Wales, and uh, whether or not uh, the banks that you represent or are involved with have had much interaction or contact with the British Business Bank. So I wonder, Kerry Sharp, if you wanted to begin with some comments on that. Yep, sure. Thank you very much. Um, so we um, have a really good relationship with the British Business Bank. Um, they undertake quite a, a number of different activities, uh, and many of them focused um, on Scotland as well as elsewhere in the UK. They're particularly active in Scotland in the startup loans side, um, and also the enterprise finance guarantee, the, the bank debt guarantee scheme. We um, often engage with them on trying to understand the, the breadth and scale of their activity, um, but they do record things slightly differently than, than we do, including um, capturing all the private sector leverage that they achieve through deployment of their funds, which makes it quite difficult for us to compare the numbers. Um, but they are very active on those uh, two instruments in particular, and we think from stats that we do see that Scotland gets its fair share. They're also quite active in the, the VC investment side. So they're um, LPs in three of our largest VC funds in Scotland, uh, Panoramic and SEP um, being two of them. Um, and we uh, continually work with them to, to see what else they can do and what further funds can be deployed in Scotland. Thank you. And, and Rob Hunter, do you have a um, comment you can make? And I, I should have said that there's no need to press buttons or anything. The, the mic system will be operated by the sound desk. And if you want to come in, just indicate by raising your hand. But uh, okay. Rob Hunter. Um, I think it's uh, very similar in Wales. Uh, we have a very good uh, working relationship with the British Business Bank. And in fact, as devolved nations, uh, we meet regularly with uh, the British Business Bank. And they do give us an awful lot of time. Um, I, I would echo the comment that um, we do have an, a, an issue with, uh, if you like, the transparency of the information, and it's, it's more to do with their systems than anything else, but it's kind of mixed up. It's very difficult for us to compare apples with apples because they do mix in uh, the private sector leverage that they achieve on a deal in with their own investments, so it's very difficult to work out what it is uh, that's actually gone into the region. But according to the stats, just like Scotland, I think Wales is receiving uh, its fair share. Uh, in addition to that, um, once again, I think EFG um, um, and the startup loans uh, is very good. Uh, in Wales, for example, since startup loans um, began, uh, they've invested somewhere in the order of about £20 million across Wales in startup loans. These are very low value loans. Um, and uh, that kind of complements about the same amount that uh, the Development Bank has invested in microfinance. So when you look at the two together, there's, there's very little, if any, overlap, and it's managed to deliver about 40 million of microfinance into businesses across Wales uh, between us and the British Business Bank. So in that case, I think they are definitely a force for good. Thank you. Now, John Mason. Uh, thanks very much, Convener. And it was, uh, I was wanting to ask about um, the integration and how the uh, Scottish Investment Bank will kind of move over, and maybe you could explain a bit about that 
uh, although I might come onto Wales a bit as well later. So, I mean, is it the case that basically the whole Scottish Investment Bank, lock, stock and barrel, will move over and become part of the Scottish National Investment Bank? Um, so obviously the plans for the bank are very much to build on what exists in the market and integrate um, interventions and activities that, that exist across the public sector. Um, and th there's still work ongoing as to exactly what will go into the bank, but it's been quite clear um, since the implementation plan that the Scottish Investment Bank activities will form part of the bank. Now, that's not everything. Uh, the financial readiness service that we delivered just now will stay within Scottish Enterprise, and that's because it is a company support <laughs> activity and fits better um, with the wider Scottish Enterprise. It, it doesn't uh, deploy any, any finance. Um, so the activities, the functions of the Scottish Investment Bank, um, the assets um, that have been um, invested are, are linked to, and also the people are all expected to, to move into the bank. There's a lot of work underway uh, just now trying to work out exactly how and when that will happen and what further work we need to do. Um, the plan is sort of shortly after um, you know, vesting that the, all the items that are expected to, uh, to go across will we'll move across at that point. So, so would it be fair to say that the broad split is if, if it was advice or grant making, it would stay with Scottish Enterprise, but if it's um, loan or equity investment, it would move over to SNOOB? Yeah, that's about right. right. And, and therefore, would the, would the staff kind of split in, re in reflection of that, that some staff would say and some staff yeah, would go? Yeah, so within the Scottish Investment Bank, the vast majority of staff are on the financing side or support services thereof. There's a discrete team in the Financial Readiness Service, that's about um, eight or nine people. And, uh, and the demarcation is quite clear. Uh, those individuals will, will stay. And it's, it's obviously, there's a lot of work needs to be done to kind of dot the I's across the T's, but the, the working assumption is that all of the rest of the staff within SIB will move across. Okay. And, I mean, the, the, the kind of level of governance and accountability now, obviously Scottish Enterprise is a kind of independent body at the moment, as would the SNIB be, but they're slightly different models. So w would you anticipate any difference from a kind of government or a parliament point of view as to the level of oversight, uh, or would that just be much the same, whether it's Scottish Enterprise or um, SNIB? Of the, the SIB activities when it moves yes, into yeah, exactly. That's what the, I mean. the new yes. bank. Yeah. <clears throat> um, obviously, uh, you know, government and the, the bill will determine how the, the, the reporting and all the elements you, are, are delivered by the bank going forward. Um, but we have a, a very strong um, governance and reporting culture. Um, so I kind of struggle to think there'll be, you know, too much else that we need to do. There's obviously more work to be done on the ethics policy and the like for the bank going forward, which, you know, will be directed by, uh, you know, whatever requirements are, are needed and our uh, activities and our reporting functions will, will support what's what's required. Okay, I mean, I think I've got colleagues wanting to come in with supplementaries. Could I ask you, Mr Hunter, am, am I right in saying that it was Finance Wales was the previous body and they've, it, it's entirely moved over into the Development Bank of Wales? Yes, that was yes. exactly the case. And, and of course, we, we kind of had an advantage that Finance Wales was a PLC. So, in effect, it was set up, it had all the governance structures, it had all of the funds, and then it transitioned into becoming the Development Bank of Wales. Right. And did that process go quite smoothly? And uh, It did, with an awful lot of preparation. I think we were working towards the launch for two years. And I think one of the challenges when you're changing uh, an entity that already exists into something new is you, you really need to deliver something new when the time comes. Uh, so we had a, a build-up for about two years, raising new funds, um, ready for the launch, ready for the announcements, and also preparing the staff and preparing the culture of the organisation to be new and different. And, and I think we managed that actually across Wales. So it's been a, 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 a fairly significant shift, I think, in the perception of what the organisation does and, and also the expectations on the organisation uh, since we launched as a development bank. So, um, but yeah, it's, it, it did take an awful lot of work. So, so I mean, you, you were wanting to do something new and therefore it, it was a new organisation. Presumably there were some good things that you wanted to carry on yes. and, and that's broadly been okay? Yeah, it has. I, th I think one, one of the complexities of, in our case, was uh, the first access to finance review was in about 2012 and that then led to the uh, feasibility study into the development bank. 
And what happened uh, within those reviews, there were very good ideas. There were things that um, uh, we were being told it would be great to launch a specific fund, for example, to increase uh, microfinance across Wales would be one example, or seed funding across Wales. Uh, and rather than waiting until we launched as a development bank, Finance Wales actually started that change probably in about 2013. So the actual transition to the development bank, it, it didn't happen sort of at midnight in October, whatever date it was, in, in 2017. Uh, it was actually a transition which took place over a period of about four years and culminated in that change to a development bank. So we'd already done a significant shift actually before the launch date. Okay, thanks so much. Andy Whiteman. Thanks, convener. Just a couple of questions on structures. Uh, first to uh, Kerry Sharp. What's the difference between the Scottish <coughs> Investment Bank and the Scottish National Investment Bank, other than the insertion of the word national? Uh, well, well, quite a lot. Um, so, as you're aware, I've said as part of Scottish Enterprise at the moment, our focus is on um, early stage risk capital um, and lending up to uh, you know two million, maybe up to five million. Um, and also, we deliver the Energy Investment Fund for Scottish Government, which is a low carbon focused, mission-led fund. Um, we deliver only um, an element of what the new Scottish National Investment Bank is going to be doing. It's going to be a separate legal entity with all that, that goes with that, which I know you've talked about uh, you know, various times in the committee. Um, and it, the breadth and scale of the activities are quite significant compared to what we've done. So I see it very much as building on the success that we've created to date, but doing a lot more for the economy and really making a, a step change in both the capital available and the areas that the bank will be able to look at. But is there anything the Scottish National Investment Bank has planned to do that you can't do? Well, certainly the, the scale of capital that uh, the bank's going to deploy couldn't be deployed within Scottish Enterprise. It would be too significant for, for the organisation. There's obviously uh, discussions underway around dispensations from Treasury, which uh, obviously the, the, in the team working on are hopeful that they'll be forthcoming. And if they are, that'll be a really significant change to the way that the bank is able to, to operate, which will be much more beneficial for the impact it wants to make in the market. OK, and uh, uh, Mr Hunter, um uh, was the Welsh Development Bank or Finance Wales um, established by statute or not? Uh, yes, it kind of, it, it, well, kind of. It dates back to uh, uh, the WDA Act, uh, the Welsh Development Agency Act in the 1970s, I think 1974 or something like that was the original act. Uh, that was uh, uh, updated by the Government of Wales Act uh, 2006, which has provision for Finance Wales uh, in that. Uh, the formation of the Development Bank wasn't done through statute. Uh, that was just, a, a, if you like, a, a, a branding, a, a change to the name and a change to the focus of the organisation, if you like, a change to the missions. And the capitalisation of the bank is undertaken how? Uh, it's, it's actually a very different model to the one I think that's being proposed for the Scottish National Investment Bank. Uh, in effect, we're, to say we're not capitalised, we are capitalised. So um, since launch, in fact, on the lead up to launch, uh, sort of in the 18 months on the lead up to launch, we uh, uh, achieved a commitment from government to an additional about 154 million funds. And since the launch in October 2017, uh, we've received commitments of a further 430 million of funding uh, for the bank. So significant sums of money have been committed. But um, the way it operates, we have about 15 funds, and each individual fund, we go to government with a business case for that fund. So it's in the Treasury Model 5 case, uh, business case. Uh, and that's approved by the department, and then the money's released to us through the life of the fund. So it's, it's a different operating model. We don't have the autonomy to make that decision on our own as to how to deploy the money. We have to do that through government departments. And, and actually, I've got to say, for us, it's been working exceptionally well. OK, thank you. <clears throat> Gordon MacDonald. Okay, convener. Uh, evidence to the committee suggests that despite an increase in uh, private capital in Scotland, uh, there is investment still low and there's a lack of demand. If this is the case in Scotland, what are the factors that can inhibit demand? So um, demand is always quite a difficult um, area. Um, it's very clear from our understanding of the market that demand takes different forms. And 
Often the problem that we see is having the right supply for the particular demand that exists at any point in time. Um, so flexibility. Um, so I think the bank being flexible and agile in its approach is going to be really important. You know, gaps don't don't stay the same. Um, they're they're changing all the time, and the response that the bank's going to have to those gaps is going to be incredibly important. Um, and also on the mission-led side, there's going to be a need to to think far and wide as to what you know different. Um, supports and technologies and, and, and companies can be supported to achieve the mission that you know the bank is looking to uh, you know to um, to deliver against for the government it's not going to be a case of one size fits all it's not going to be a case of you know the answers over there you know we just invest in that it'll all be fine there's going to be you know different types of technologies different responses different innovation uh, and the most important thing is to be close to the market to be informed uh, to uh, you know to challenge uh, you know what's there and to make sure that they you know the companies are um, you know, spoken to and the responses can reflect what they would really need and the projects and the companies and everybody, everybody else is going to be supported by the bank going forward. But do you believe that there is a, a lack of demand for patient capital in Scotland? I think there's a, a need to make more of the demand viable and um, interested in raising the funding. There's definitely gaps in the market. We are supporting some of them just now, and our valuation says that uh, the role that we play is fundamental to the market, and you know we can't step out or you know won't you know, won't exist. So there's absolutely gaps there. And um, what we need is more demand. We need more demand stimulated. Um, we need more uh, you know support mechanisms to uh, you know to work with the companies to to make sure that they're keen to take that next stage in their journey and that the confidence in the market is going to be incredibly important and I think the bank has a really uh, strong role in that even just existing uh, as an entity with the amount of capital that's uh, it's being earmarked for it being a trusted transparent entity with strong ethics and you know working practices is going to create demand from companies to say actually you know that's somebody that I want to to work with. How, how will you stimulate that demand other than the fact as I've just said is it going to be through working with the development agencies or, or what? Absolutely. You know, without a doubt, the ecosystem and how it works together is going to be the most important part, I think, of the bank being able to deliver. And um, what we do know is supply in its own is, is not enough, you know, to your point, you know, demand is clearly important. Um, and I see the bank is leading on the supply side, um, but the um, enterprise agencies in particular and others in the market leading on the demand side, um, but with obviously a lot of cross-working. There's going to be a need for the system to work well, for integrated support and services, for there to be four you know, to be able to discuss, you know, how we move the market forward, but without a doubt, it sits across a number of, of different parties. Mr. Hunter, I noticed that the Development Bank of Wales, uh, that was established in October 17, in its last full financial year in March 19, um, it had investments of 80 million, 18 percent higher than the year before, and the actual number of investments increased by 30 percent to 420 across Wales. How do you manage demand and meet demand in Wales? Uh, it's uh, well. The the original targets for the for the organisation were set out in a business case, which was produced in 2016, and uh, our aim was to reach around 80 million of investment by 2022. Um, so we've actually achieved that in the first two years of of the bank. Um, what we found, I think, is uh, that. Um, Demand comes well, and demand I think across Wales comes from a n number of different different places. I know within Scotland you you have a challenge of two hundred million a year that that you want to invest across Scotland. I personally think that's probably about the right level uh, to to be aiming at uh, uh, from the experience in Wales. But I'd probably echo what Kerry said in terms of um, I think the Scottish National Investment Bank needs to remain highly flexible uh, in trying to meet the widest demands of the business, because you mentioned patient capital, for example. Now, two-thirds of all of our funds um, uh, can give access to patient capital in Wales, but that one-third that, that doesn't do patient capital, it does short-term, sometimes fast-revolving funds, um, is also a critical part, and it's a critical part of the uh, ecosystem in Wales. And also, uh, they are very important gaps that can deliver quite a lot of economic benefit, as well as financial benefit, actually. Um, so... I think where we've been very fortunate and uh, is our remit is very wide. And uh, once we formed, uh, just it's, this is an amazing thing. But just 
the fact that we became a bank and we were serious about being a bank. So it, we, we've, you know, we've put something genuine behind it. Um, uh, has created a lot of demand and interest across government. So we've been speaking to various government departments. And I mean, if I go back uh, two years, I wouldn't have guessed that one of our KPIs would have been uh, the number of homes built in Wales, for example. Um, uh, and that's driven through our residential property funds. Um, a lot of the ideas are coming through government departments. And we're lucky enough that we haven't been restricted or we don't have anything that absolutely restricts us. So uh, I suppose the only piece of advice I could probably give uh, Scotland is uh, leave things as open as you possibly can. Don't close things down. Uh, an interesting one, if I could, is... Um, uh, for example, it seems obvious when you're talking about a development bank that it should only lend to SMEs. That just seems... It seems very obvious. Uh, but actually, I believe, uh, and we, we administer the Help to Buy Wales scheme on behalf of the government, so we actually do lend to individuals. Um, but we're just about to uh, launch a self-build fund for people to build their own homes, uh, very much aligned with lots of other interventions from government to make it easy for people to um, pick a plot so the local authorities designate a site. They call them plot shops. They put the services in. An individual can go along, choose from a pattern book. Uh, they're then put onto a builder who's registered, so they know they're going to get a good builder. And we will provide, um, uh, if you like, the bridging finance for the build of the house, which will then be remortgaged out. Now, what that gives us the ability to do, because we can fund the builder, the small builder, through our small loans funds, and we can also fund the purchaser. And working with local authorities and government across Wales, uh, we can actually generate an industry that doesn't currently really flourish in the United Kingdom. It does abroad, but it doesn't in the United Kingdom. Now, if we had a restriction uh, that said we can't lend to individuals, we couldn't intervene in that case. So all I would say is uh, until the bank's launched, uh, I don't think you'll really know what the capacity is, and, and we're still learning. I mean, I, I'm in discussions literally with all government departments in Wales, and there's a lot of things where it would be inappropriate or um, uh, inefficient to uh, have the involvement of the development bank. But the fact is, when I walk into those discussions, nothing's off the table at that stage, and I think that's a really important thing. My last point, in, <clears throat> in stimulating demand, um, how important is the microloans, the, uh, the development microloans, hands out to the sector and developing demand? Yeah, I think I, there's, there's a, a number of reasons why I think those are important. And you talked, uh, in fact, you mentioned the 420 investments last year. And it won't be a surprise that an awful lot of those were delivered through microfinance. And there is a thing about actually connecting the development bank, uh, or the Scottish National Investment Bank for that matter, um, to the people and actually showing it's making a difference rather than, I don't let's say, 20 very large scale investments a year that actually is being spread across the nation and that um, businesses across the region can actually identify uh, with what's what's going on and and, uh, and sharing that success. So uh, I think that's uh, crucially important. And one of the interesting things, and I know British Business Bank have said this about uh, ROIs and things like that, that, uh, that actually they're exceeding their target. Uh, microfinance is the... Uh, I'm not saying loss-making area. I'm trying to think of a, a better way of putting it. But it's you're not going to get huge ROIs from... Um, uh, uh, providing microfinance. But what we found in Wales is actually the default rates are an awful lot less than we had originally modelled, uh, which enables us to um, revolve those funds and invest more uh, in, in those activities. So uh, I think it's, it's a crucial part for the bank. And it really does go back to that point that there isn't a single market gap. Uh, market gaps, I believe, exist right across the spectrum from very, very small people who need a couple hundred pounds to, to buy a sewing machine or whatever it is which gets them into business, right up to the large-scale five and ten million pound investments, and, uh, and right across sectors as well. So, um, uh, yeah, so that's right. Thank you very much. Mm. Jackie Bailey. Thank you, convener. Can I put my first couple of questions to Ms Sharp? Um, I think the, it, 
case that the Scottish European Growth Programme um, uptake was certainly slow. Um, and I think in a submission to committee previously, Sib said that's because it was a new fund, it was different, it would take time to educate companies and investors. Um, could you maybe update us on progress in delivering that? Um, and are there lessons that the SNB can learn from your experience? Sure, thank you for that. Um, so the Scottish European Growth Co-Investment Programme, or SCGCP for short, slightly easier, um, it has been slower than we would have liked. We've now done three deals. Um, investments about 1.53 million, leveraged 8.5 million. We're about to do two more deals. I'd sort of hope they might have been done for today, but not yet, but they're imminent. Um, and that should see us deploy around uh, 1.7 million, leveraging another 5 million. Um, there's a couple of deals that we nearly did. Um, one of them, uh, the company managed to raise the, the level of funding that they needed and didn't need our money. Um, and also another that's decided to, uh, to go into a sales mode instead of a fund raising mode. Um, we've got about 120 odd inquiries in our books at the moment. Um, probably 30 or so of them were actively working on making introductions and uh, supporting them with their, um, their business plan and their, their pitch and the like. Um, it's certainly been slower than we would have liked, um, without a doubt. However, it was always a niche fund. That was the objective. We only expected to, uh, to support maybe uh, you know, five or six or seven uh, companies a year. Um, that said, uh, what we've learned is it always takes longer with a new initiative, even when you think you've planned in. Um, enough, enough delay always takes longer. Um, without a doubt, Brexit has played quite a, you know, quite a, a, a negative role in the uptake, both from the investor side, we're speaking to um, a lot of investors based um, across Europe, uh, the relationships with the EIF, the European Investment Fund, um, and some of the investors are, are slightly nervous um, of where they're investing their money at the moment. And likewise, um, we're finding with some of the companies when we're encouraging them to speak to uh, some of the European investors and given the role of the EIF, um, it's, it's kind of causing them to, to, to think a little bit more. So uh, I think from the um, Scottish National Investment Bank point of view, it's back to probably my earlier comments around um, you know, being, being clear in what the market gap is, being flexible in approach. I mean, one of the, you know, the, the benefits of the way this is set up is the relationship with the IF and their fund managers, um, but that now is also downside because it's quite, quite particular, um, and therefore there are you know, deals um, and investors are not eligible. So having more flexibility in the, the instruments being delivered would be quite useful for the bank going forward, I think. Okay. Can I pick you up on a couple of points? Because you said um, that... that investment was uncertain because of Brexit. My understanding when it was announced in the programme for government was this fund was set up indeed to counter some of the impact of Brexit. So I'm, I'm uh, quite interested in what you had to say there. Could you remind us about the amount you had expected to spend? Because if my memory is right, it was 10 million year one, another 10 million now, um, and that was just SE's contribution, the drawdown would have been much more significant, um, and we are very well short of that. Yes, that's correct. So it was a 50 mil commitment that we um, got from government that we then committed to the programme, so we're, we're, we are indeed well short of that. Um, back to your earlier point on Brexit, it wasn't set up to counter Brexit, it was a window of opportunity that we had. The relationship that we've got with the, the EIF allowed us to access funding that is certainly available until we exit. Whether it's available after that or not, we don't yet know. So the, the proposition we had was it was a window of opportunity for us to be able to access this funding, which we knew the longer we delayed, the less opportunity to have uh, that, that access available to us. And we will see through the negotiations whether we can continue to access the funding or not. My recollection is it was announced as a package of measures in the programme for government that was designed to, if you like, make the Scottish economy more resilient to Brexit. And that was the centrepiece of, of the announcement. So I'm, I'm just it's slightly at odds with what, what you're saying. That's perhaps a measure of political spin rather than anything I would else. certainly not comment to that, Indeed. but I don't recollect that uh, statement at all, so I can't say anything on my phone. Okay. Um, you've spoken a little bit earlier about the need for um, demand stimulation activities. You know, could you maybe elaborate on what activities actually need to be delivered on the demand side <laughs> and whether you think there's sufficient capacity and resources within the enterprise agencies to do that? So, 
Um, I mentioned earlier the important role of the bank um, existing. Um, between all the players in the ecosystem, there's a need to really join together to make sure there's a stronger digital approach to allow access and easier access to, to companies and to projects and communities. Um, making sure the, um, you know, the system is joined up as it can to make sure there's no wrong door, that the customer journey is as smooth as possible, to make sure that when somebody approaches um, anybody in the public sector, they can find their way to wherever the funding uh, might be. Uh, we, we've talked, there, there's lots of work underway from the um, Enterprise and Skills Review already, and um, Strategic Board's obviously leading, leading on that. Uh, so some of this work is, is at play, but there's a need to make sure that you know, those um, involved are also engaging in the same way with the bank going forward. And I know there's been uh, you know, initial discussions to make sure that that's, that's what happens. One of the outputs from a recent committee inquiry was um, it, the lack of join in some areas between Business Gateway and Scottish Enterprise. Is that something that, that is being actively considered? Because that would be the first step for a company perhaps accessing funding. Yes, yeah, so um, you know, with, with uh, large organisations, it's always difficult to get that as smooth as possible. And obviously, the structure of Business Gateway can make that you know, slightly more challenging. Um, but you know, without a doubt, Business Gateway play a really important role uh, in the ecosystem, the same way as other players do. So the need to um, ensure that it's as joined up as possible alongside the rest of the ecosystem, I absolutely agree with. Um, certainly our financial readiness team, who are the, uh, the team that will stay within Scottish Enterprise to provide the company support, work very strongly um, with Business Gateway. They're often found kind of based in one of their offices, um, getting closer to the companies and supporting the Business Gateway advisors with the financial readiness advice, which is growing in importance. That area of specialism is very much the linchpin, I think, between the wider enterprise business gateway type of support and the funding support that the, the bank's going to provide. Okay, thank you very much. Can I turn to Mr Hunter? Because one of the major transitions from Finance Wales to the Development Bank of Wales um, was the commitment to work much more closely with public sector business support. Um, so can you update the committee on, on how that's evolving? And are there lessons for us to learn? Because I'm conscious we have a number of different enterprise agencies, all with something to give in this space. And I'm wondering whether we need to join that up more than is currently the case. Yeah, well, the, the, the main provider of advice and support to businesses in Wales is, is uh, uh, Business Wales. Uh, and uh, there was a lot of discussion actually around uh, how we could better integrate with them. Um, we now actually have uh, board representation, so we have one of our one of our uh, people on their board, and they have one of their people. In fact, the person who leads it on on our board as the observer. So um, uh, that was uh, a first step. The second thing was, I think, a, a recognition that we wanted to hide the wiring as far as businesses are concerned. So instead of um, uh, what tended to happen uh, where a business might phone for uh, uh, what turned out to be commercial finance uh, into business wells and got battered around various departments and various individuals and ended up with us eventually, uh, what happens now is there's an automatic routing. So, in effect, uh, one phone call in and uh, we, on both sides, have a mutual arrangement to make sure that the service is completely joined up. Um, Business Wales are hugely important to us and their representatives on the ground uh, are an enormous uh, source of, of leads for us. So it's, it's very important that, that we do work seamlessly with them. Um, but probably like Scotland, there are lots of other players in the economy department as well who are um, coordinating other uh, grant schemes or other areas of support. And uh, that's been another, uh, I think, significant shift. Um, in about two weeks' time, I think it's going to be the first time, but we're having a full joint strategy session uh, between the Department for Economy and all of the aspects of that. There has been a change and a reorganisation this year uh, of that department, which is driving this, uh, and the Development Bank of Wales to see uh, how we could assist them. And in fact, I mean, what, one of the developments, as I said, you know, when you're sort of growing this thing, you don't know what's there until, until you start to discuss it. Um, but with enormous um, uh, pressure on capital budgets in government, uh, one of the things uh, we've been able to work with government on is uh, how they can stretch their grant schemes and make uh, best use of that, uh, that Welsh pound, if you like. Uh, and uh, 
I think historically, if you look at the way grants have been administered, there's been a binary decision, really. Should it be a grant or could we commercially support it? Uh, and actually, I think it's rarely binary. I think actually, in the vast majority of cases, um, uh, you don't need to give a 100% grant. There's an element of whatever the intervention is, which actually is commercial and should be repaid. Uh, and we've, uh, in the last year, we've launched uh, three funds uh, across uh, government, two government departments, uh, where we have a commercial element which sits right alongside um, uh, uh, Welsh Government grant scheme. So, for example, the Property Development Grant, which is administered in the Department for Economy uh, for commercial premises, uh, they've put 15 million of grant into a pot, and we have 40 million, which sits alongside that as a, as, as a fund, and we work uh, the two together. So, they administer the grants under their um, GBA scheme or whatever uh, um, uh, uh, state aid uh, cover they have for the grant, and we do the commercial finance element. Um, and actually the results of that can be uh, incredible uh, because some of these funds are actually quite fast revolving so you might get two or three revolutions out of it. So if you look at that grant money, 15 million going in, um, if we revolve it two or three times uh, we might get 160 million of delivery across Wales for 15 million of grants if you look at it that way. So, so these are innovative approaches not just, and, and this is about combining the thing genuinely together and seeing the bank as a solution right across government. Thank you very much, Convener. Colin Beattie. Thank you, Convener. Um, there's three areas I'd like to uh, just explore a little bit. One is patient capital. We've touched on that uh, already. Um, D DBW extended its loan repayments <coughs> to 10 years, and this is viewed as a, a long overdue um, development. Uh, and, and I think it led to quite a, an increase in demand for that type of patient capital among Welsh businesses. What does SIB currently do in terms of patient capital? Um, so I would say everything that we do is patient capital. Um, the largest part of what we deliver is early stage equity investment. And I think if you um, talk to anybody in that area, they'll tell you you have to be patient if you want to, to be in that area. The exit horizon timeline is around 10 to 12 years. Um, we've got a number of investments that are older than that. Um, we are not required to force any exits. We're there to support the company, support the growth of the company, working alongside the, the private sector investors. Um, so very much um, a, a, a patient approach. We launched a new loan scheme last December under the Scottish Growth Scheme. Um, the repayment terms are around about seven years, normally up to seven years. That, that's the demand that we've got in the market at the moment. We can be flexible in that. It's a pilot. We will absolutely be looking at whether there's a need for that to be longer. And if there is, then, then we'll certainly look at that. So we don't see that as, as not patient. Um, the Energy Investment Fund, which I mentioned earlier, which is our fund focused on low carbon, um, is... is very flexible and I think the team would tell you very patient. They do a, a phenomenal role right from uh, market making, developing the market, um, intensive financial readiness with uh, community projects and um, uh, wider low carbon projects right through to structuring and um, investing or lending. And the loans to the community projects are sort of 10 to 15 years normally, sometimes more, and the returns coming back to the community, um, the benefits coming back on the back of those are 25 years or so. So overall, uh, a very patient approach. You seem to be mainly talking about uh, loans. Do you do any equity investment in terms of patient well, the, the The first bit of my... Um, uh, comments there was on our equity funds. So the majority of our investments are equity um, and also the energy investment fund does debt and equity kind of equal proportions of, of both. So very focused on, on equity as well as now starting to do more on the lending side. Do you believe you're meeting the current needs for patient capital? So we believe we're playing a really strong um, fundamental role in the market, providing the level of patient capital that we are. Um, you know, akin to you know, I mentioned earlier about the the real impact that the bank can make going forward. There, there's potential for a lot more patient capital to be provided. Scale up capital, in particular, is something that we've been looking at. SAGSP, as I mentioned earlier, is the response that we've got um, to that at the moment. But we feel there's a need to to look at doing more in that area. 
So, how much of a how much of a step change in the market is SNIB going to make in terms of uh, the patient capital that it's envisaged to provide? So the the focus of the bank in having the level of capital available to uh, to try and you know change the market dynamics and to identify additional gaps and uh, changing gaps, evolving gaps, um, will be you know really I think transformational to the economy. The you know the challenge on the way that we operate just now is is the, the amount of um, budget and funding that's, that's available. Um, the the commitment the government have made can really then allow, and over such a long time as well, can allow the bank team to really look forward and to really start to make you know different choices. One thing that we've certainly identified from the Energy Investment Fund is you need to be ambitious and you need to be very patient. You need to have a different approach when it's, it's new technologies, it's emerging markets. So I think the bank will be able to really focus a lot of its attention, its funding, on really making some substantial investments and, and change uh, the way our economy is. So would you say that SNIB is taking the right uh, approach to the market? Yes, I believe so. Okay, just to, just to move on to target rate of return, which is always a, an interesting one. I mean, the financial target rate of return will be set for the bank and finalised prior to the vesting of the company. What's the target rate of return for SIB and DBW? So we don't have a target rate of return. At the moment, uh, it's not been a requirement on us. We act commercially in all of our investments, and we seek to maximise the return. But we don't need to, um, you know, select our portfolio or select our approach to achieve a certain target. So, what is your rate of return? So um, there's lots of different ways of of cutting it down. The exits that we have made have been very successful. Our return overall is around 29% IRR on the successful exits. When we also include the write-offs, which is also an important part of looking at it in the round, it's around 9%. Uh, if we also include um, our current portfolio, which is quite sizable, it's valued at over uh, 300 million. Um, if we look at that and, and bring that all together, then we're about break even. What sort of percentage failure do you, well, what, what sort of percentage failure are, are you actually having on capital employed there? So we will be around about 20%. I'll need to just double check that figure. We've had write offs. Um, of 80 million since we um, started activities in 2003, and I think that comes out about 20%. But I'll check that figure for you. Is that comparable with other institutions of a similar nature? Well, it's very difficult to compare what we do to to others, uh, given we fill gaps in the market, and uh, through our equity funds, deals are brought to us from the private sector. We're sort of in the highest risk of the the highest risk in a very risk area, um, so there's not many people that are comparable to that. Um, but certainly, we are very comfortable with that level um, of, of failure and of write-off. Uh, I, I know there's some that would probably say it should be higher if you're really making a difference in the market. Um, but clearly, we're not keen to uh, to lose money. We're trying to, to make money. Um, but certainly, we're, we're comfortable with what that looks like just now. But DBW? Uh, well, uh, very similar story, really. We don't have a, a set uh, target ROI. And actually, I'm quite pleased we don't have a set target uh, ROI. What we tend to do is we will negotiate an ROI or a projected ROI on a case-by-case -case basis because, as I said earlier, we, you know, ev every single one of our funds we, we create a business case for and we negotiate with the Welsh Government on what sort of return they're looking for uh, from that fund. And then once the fund goes live, we manage that fund or the portfolio of investments of that fund to deliver the ROI which was agreed. Now, when you aggregate all of that up, um, whether that comes to a positive ROI for an organisation or uh, less. Um, I'm not sure how critical that really is. Um, we are playing in that very, very difficult part of the market. And if you have uh, uh, very high expectations of an ROI, then there is, I think, a great temptation to start to uh, take on less risky, more market-facing um, uh, investments. And then all you're doing is displacing the market. And what we want to do is to crowd funders into Wales, not, not crowd existing funders out of Wales. Um, so, uh, But the answer to the question is very similar, actually. I think our target ROI at the moment, when we're sort of 
of measuring it is positive for about 0.7%. That's what it's forecast to be um, uh, at this stage. But as I say, that's not, not sort of um, uh, set in stone. The other thing I think, which is important from our point of view, which may or may not be a difference, is our operating costs are covered through the fees we charge on the funds. Um, so we don't have any um, government subsidy to our operating costs uh, at all. We have to um, uh, operate uh, and stand on our own two feet, if you like, as an organisation and, and fully cover our cost. Uh, so uh, that's also factored into those calculations. Do you think that it's the right thing for SNB to do to have a, a target rate of return right from day one? So um, I think that's probably a question for, for government to decide upon. Um, certainly... I, was your I mean, I'm hearing from both of you that, there's, that you don't have a, a target rate. And uh, I don't know whether that's uh, a good thing or a bad thing. So, I mean, certainly from my point of view, we don't have a target rate of return, but we are targeted to do lots of things. Um, and one of those things, for example, is increasing the size of the, the LSD risk capital market, which we've been very successful in, in doing. It's grown fourfold in, since 2012. Um, and that's from the, you know, our investment and the amount of leverage that uh, that we achieve in, in the market. So that there's lots of things that we're targeted to do. Um, if you're targeted to um, deliver financial return, then it does have consequences in how you will operate, without a doubt. One of the benefits of the bank being um, the scale and breadth that it's uh, planned to be is there's going to be different ways to do different things. So it's entirely possible for one part of the bank um, to have either a different uh, target rate of return or, or no target rate of return, depending on you know what it's set out to do. Um, but you know the, the challenge you know, definitely in the economy is the need for um, for income to flow and for government's commitment not to be uh, you know too long to the future, which is clearly why they're either looking at um, a rate of return um, and one that they think is reasonable. And clearly there are examples like BBB um, who have had one and, and exceeded it. So there's examples that can be looked upon uh, to work out the, the best way for, uh, for Scottish Government to put that into place. If you were pushed, what sort of uh, target rate of return do you think SNB should be aiming for? Um, so since you're pushing me, um, and since I'm going to be part of the bank, I would say a low one, which would make uh, life a little easier. Um, I certainly think that the bank will have to be very realistic um, on it. Um, I would certainly be looking at BBB as to you know why they thought that return was um, was appropriate and um, you know understanding their their performance on it. Um, I would certainly advise against a high one because without a doubt, um, you know, that's going to be challenging to achieve uh, and it, it will change behaviours. And given, you know, the bank is around uh, patient capital and the change that uh, the ministers want to see in the economy, I think they need to be uh, careful and conscious of that when, when setting uh, things that are going to um, determine how people operate day to day. Just continuing perhaps slightly down that road, um, Clearly, SNB is perhaps going to have a, a high risk profile, as indeed does SIB. Given that risk profile, is the expected break-even timeline of 2023-24 realistic? So I don't think that's a break-even timeline. I think that's the timeline for the operational costs to be covered, so self-funding rather than self-financing, which would be um, kind of 10 years or so. Um, Actually, sorry, I'm not no, 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 no problem at all. Um, so, I mean, we, we've covered our operational costs for a large number of years. Um, and certainly, I think it's it's entirely possible for, for the bank to do that. Clearly, it'll depend on what its costs end up being, um, given where they're kind of set out to be proposed at the moment. Um, certainly, with our activities alone, plus a number of other activities that we know are going to move in, plus all the new things the bank's going to do, I think that's entirely um, achievable. How long did it take you to become self-funding in terms of operational cost? Um, so I don't have the answer to that, um, but we are staffing costs within SIB um, at the moment are around about 3.3 million. We've obviously grown over a number of years, given our activities have grown, um, and our income over the last five years is on average over 20 million. Um, so I can't actually tell you when when we, we kind of covered our costs, but it was quite quite a long time ago. Now for DBW, uh, I think you've already said that you cover your running costs from fees. Uh, how long did it take you to get to that point where you were covering your costs? 
It's, it was quite an interesting one. I mean, when, when, when I started in the role, one of the first jobs I had to do was to uh, coordinate the production of a financial model for the business, which brought all of the funds and all of the costs together and projected forward, uh, in effect, how much funds we would need over the five-year period to generate enough fees to cover our costs. Uh, and the figure came out at £154 million over the first five years. Um, interestingly, by the time we reached around June, July uh, 2017, uh, we'd received uh, commitments to all but 23 million of it. Uh, and because that figure was actually relatively small, I suppose, in the grand scheme of things, uh, the minister at the time said, well, I'm not signing the bank off until we've given you the commitment to the full amount. Uh, so we actually had uh, a commitment sort of about a week before we launched for the final 23 million. So in essence, at launch, um, uh, that was when we stopped receiving any, any government grant. Uh, as I said, I mean, it, it, it's a strange thing, and I think this is where the, the sort of demand question sort of comes back. Um, to be honest, raising 430 million in, in the two years since then of uh, additional commitments to funds, uh, we genuinely couldn't predict that. We thought the 154 would have been a tough ask, to be honest, when we produced that, uh, that, that, that first business case. But I think that's sort of testament to the fact that if it's done properly and uh, uh, if it's done with the sort of gravitas that you would want for such a, a, a national long-term institution, uh, the amount of interest it generates uh, from other players uh, generates its own demand, if you like. Um, so, so actually, looking forward, I would say um, we're covered for at least the next uh, seven or eight years, probably, in terms of our operating costs, uh, just on our existing funds. Andy Whiteman. Uh, thanks very much, Convener. I'm talking about costs. Um, one of the things we've been discussing is remuneration for the Scottish National Investment Bank. Um, we've had mixed views. Um, some people feel it should operate um, a remuneration policy consistent with what the financial sector does. Others take uh, more of the view that it's a public body uh, and should reflect uh, public sector pay levels. What's the position uh, in Wales? Well, in answer to that question, I know this is sound strange, but the answer is probably yes, actually to both. Um, so if I, if I go through our process for um, uh, uh, setting our salaries, uh, we are not on civil service salaries. There is a, a very small element of the organisation uh, that are on local government pensions, but that's down to uh, less than 10% now, and uh, that scheme hasn't been open to new people for about seven or eight years. Uh, we market test our salaries every three years um, uh, uh, independently. Uh, we use two benchmarks, both the financial services industry and the non-financial services industry. Uh, uh, now, certain specialists we have, particularly on the equity deal doer side, because I'm not sure, you know, I mean, we, we are a fund manager effectively, so we contract out some funds, but the vast majority we deliver ourselves. Um, so we, the, the pinch points really for our, 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 the higher salaries are going to be around uh, um, the equity staff. Uh, um, so we look at those. Uh, and um, the thing we've recognised is actually, I think our salaries are, are, are pretty much in line, and I'll come back to a comparison with government in a minute, but our, our salaries are pretty attractive um, for the non-financial services people and for the non-equity deal-doer people. Uh, we've adjusted our salaries for the people who are doing equity, but uh, one of the things we recognise is uh, we can offer the kind of uh, stellar bonuses that uh, you can get uh, if you're working in the private sector. Now, it's high risk, but it's, it's high return. So one of the things we recognise when we're attracting those people into the business is we've got to have a much wider and bigger offering. So um, we are a great place to work. Uh, our mission is to do great things and to uh, improve the economy and the conditions of the people living in Wales, which is a, a great thing to get up in the morning and come to work to do. We offer a good uh, work-life balance. Um, our targets are, are um, challenging, but they're not impossible to meet. Uh, so in effect, what we, we're developing is an employer brand to get into, into the harder to reach areas. Now, our pay is also um, uh, tempered, if you like, by um, government pay. So we have an independent review, 
uh, but all of our pay awards have to be signed off by Welsh ministers. So we've got to make sure that actually we are uh, paying sensible salary levels. And it's interesting because very recently I've been involved in a piece of work where uh, we are doing a direct comparison between the pay in the development bank and the pay in the government. And one of the things I think, uh, when you compare pay to pay, uh, the two big differences are, uh, if you're a government employee, you get um, a, a final salary pension scheme. Um, that, if you take the Welsh Government's figure, um, is an average employer contribution across the piece last year of 23.6%. Uh, we know that that's increased this year right across the entire public sector. It was being understated by 6%, so the Treasury have put another 6% on, which actually means that you take a civil service employee's pay and then you add another 30% onto it. Uh, with us, our employer contribution is around 10.8% on average across the piece, uh, and we will have an incentive scheme which is no more than 10% of our total pay bill. So uh, when you compare like with like, the salaries are actually almost it's spooky, but they're almost identical in, in real terms when you look at the average pay per grade. The difference is how we divvy that up and how we put that out there within this sector to attract the right people in. People in the financial services sector are used to working in an incentive-based environment. Uh, and working in an incentive-based environment when you're trying to deliver these funds, I think is a really useful tool. So in effect, between government and the private sector, I think the gap between those two is a lot less than most people would think, and it's about how you deploy that money rather than the quantum. Very full answer. <laughs> um, do, are, are, are any of the policies that you've developed in that regard or any of the comparisons you've done in the public domain or those internal? Uh, those, are in, those are internal. Right. I just, are, if there is internal, anything that yes. you can share with the committee... Um, that would be useful, but I understand yeah, this sure is probably not, not yes. much. Um, in terms of the Scottish Investment Bank, I presume all the staff are Scottish Enterprise employees on public sector pay grades. So. Correct. So we fully comply with the public sector pay. Um, there's obviously a mix of staff within the Scottish Investment Bank, directorate, a number of kind of non-investment specialists as well, investment specialists. What we do have in place that we um, negotiated a number of years ago is a particular allowance, which we can apply to our investment specialists to allow us to attract them in and to retain them. It's obviously quite a, a specialist skill set to have, and there, there's no doubt that you need to have the right skills to be able to deploy these sort of instruments. So that is a, um, a benefit that we can deploy um, to particular members of staff, its role and post an individual uh, specific. Okay, thanks very much. Um, moving on to the question of um, additionality, um, Mr Hunter, you talked about um, the uh, risk of uh, crowding out investors um, from Wales. And I'm just wondering how you ensure that they, or have ensured in the past and continue to ensure that the funds that you are deploying are genuinely additional in terms of the uh, investments that are available to, to, to businesses? Okay, well, um, we, we will always ask um, uh, uh, investee companies whether they have uh, uh, tried to access the market. So that's a very simple test, which is right at the beginning. Uh, that's very much driven by the history of the organisation and its deployment of EU funds, where that's a, that's a condition uh, uh, in, in any event. Um, we're very clear that we're not there to compete with the banks uh, or the private sector. And indeed, I think we've got a very good working relationship with the banks. Uh, quite often, uh, uh, the banks will come to us with a deal. Uh, it's a deal they would want to do. They believe it's a strong business case. Quite often, the problem is that of uh, security. They can only secure up to a certain amount of the loan. Quite often, that's based, uh, particularly in Wales, on property values being low. Uh, and they'll come to us and they'll say, look, we've got a million pound deal. Uh, we'd be very happy to lend for uh, 600,000 in. Uh, and we'll step in behind them uh, with 400,000 subordinated. And that gets the deal off the ground. Uh, and it works both ways. We'll work that way and we'll work um, so from the bank to us and also for us bringing, uh, putting deals forward to the bank. Uh, Kerry made a really interesting point, and it's not a KPI we can measure, but I wish we could. Um, but another testament to this is quite often, particularly on the bigger deals, so I think you're going to find this possibly on the patient capital stuff, the large scale investments, 
perhaps you know eight ten million when you're getting into that sort of round um, that you might get a company that comes to you um, their business plan their business proposal isn't really investor ready uh, the teams will put enormous amounts of effort into getting this thing uh, investor ready and at that stage they'll rush off to an investor and they'll do the deal away from. And, and we, we do get a fair bit of that as well. And it's, it's a difficult one because actually when you look at the economy of Wales, that's exactly what you want. And we can then deploy the funds we've been given elsewhere to grow the economy, the economy further. Um, but um, for those staff that are uh, incentivized or target driven, it can be uh, a little bit upsetting. Okay, and I'm most interested in um, the question of mission-orientated finance. This is something that's been advocated by Mariana Matsukato, who we spoke to a few weeks ago, and it's going to be a, um, it's, it's in the bill, it is a, a, a part of the Scottish National Investment Bank um, a purpose. Do you, do you have anything that you call mission-orientated finance? Or are you more of a conventional development bank? I, I, I'd, I'd have to understand what was meant by okay. the term mission orientated, but but it's it's interesting. A, a, a lot of the funding proposals, a lot of the things we're discussing with the government, if you like, right at the core of it, we're looking at what the government's mission is actually. Um, uh, and when we're walking in the room with government, I mean, you know, I've had meetings and I've had meetings on pretty much every aspect of government you can imagine, from care homes, domiciliary care all manner of different things, transportation, buses, trains, taxis, all sorts of stuff. Um, uh, and we, we won't be able to assist in, in many of those things, uh, but in certain instances we can. And, and the, way the, you know, the way we position ourselves is we're there to support the delivery of government priorities. And where there's a commercial element to that delivery, we want to step in and, and do a good job in that area. So. Um, but I'm not sure if that's what's meant by mission oriented finance. Mission oriented finance is, is where the government sets um, a long term mission as described in the bill, as sending a document describing the socioeconomic challenges the bank is to seek to address. So, for example, moving towards a low carbon economy or um, uh, upholding the human right to housing over typically long periods of time as well. So that's that's what that's all about. Oh, so in, in which case I can say that's very Not. much the case. And in fact, alongside uh, our standard KPIs, by the end of this year, we will be measuring ourselves against uh, a supplementary set of KPIs, which includes uh, carbon reduction, um, uh, assistance to female entrepreneurs, and, and a whole range of other KPIs which we haven't traditionally captured uh, in the past. So, and 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 actually shifting the bank towards the longer term vision and goals of government is 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 absolutely on our agenda. Those KPIs did you say new ones you'll be reporting on? Yes, in by the end of this year. So, so we're, you're not we're reporting on, on them at the moment. We haven't in the past. We're developing a set which um, we will be reporting on through this this financial year. Be a report available next summer. Next summer, yes. 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 Okay. Um, Kerry Sharp, do you have anything to say about the question of additionality in the Scottish Investment Bank? I think you mentioned a, a client who'd um, turned down your money because they had money elsewhere. So Yes, through RSE, GCP. Um, so, so, yes, so we are very much targeted towards additionality. Um, private sector leverage is one of the things that, that we record and that we try to, to maximise at every point possible. Uh, we are gap funders. That's the role that we play in the market. It's not always um, that the funding's not available, but also the time. So sometimes the time is of the essence and we can move very quickly with, with parties that we are uh, close to some of our private sector partners. So it's around um, different levels of additionality um, in the market. Um, so everything we do um, is, uh, virtually everything we do is with co-investors or, or co-lenders. So we're not doing things on our own. And in the main, the vast majority of that is brought to us by others who, who feel they've got a gap and they, they look to us to, to fund. Um, so just now, uh, we've got very strong additionality and that's exactly how I would expect the, the National Investment Bank to operate going forward as well. So you say gaps, who's identifying these gaps, the lenders or the client? Well, well both. Um, the, you know, if the, the client can't raise the funding that, that they need, then they're either coming to us directly, asking us to try and help them uh, find somebody to fund the business, which our financial readiness team do, as I mentioned earlier, and their role is very much to go and try and get funding from the private sector. That's their, you know, number one, they'll try to do that, and only when they can't do that will they look towards, uh, you know, colleagues to see what else we can do to support. Um, but where um, lenders or investors are looking to support businesses, but they 
they, they can't provide the level of funding the company needs, then they'll also come to us as well to look uh, to us to, to co-invest or, or co-lend alongside them. So do you recognise the kind of reason that Mr Hunter gave for the private sector not lending, for example, when they don't have enough security? Would that be a typical um, instance where you would consider stepping in? our debt fund, uh, it's either level security or it could be the length of, of term that they need or they can actually afford to start to repay it for a couple of years. We're very flexible in our uh, moratoriums that we'll provide, either interest or, or capital. Um, it could be that uh, just the, the future projections are um, you know, racier than maybe some of the banks or others might uh, be interested in. Um, but again, the vast majority of what we do is the equity side, where there the gap is usually just the level of um, capital the investor is willing to put at risk is not enough for the deal to, to go ahead. We need our business to be properly capitalised. There's no point investing in their business and they've not got enough capital to get to you know the next value inflection point. So where there's not sufficient capital to be deployed, then that's when our, uh, our partners or our co-investors will come to us and ask us to invest in the deal alongside them. Okay, thank you very much. Angela Constance. Uh, thank you, convener. Uh, good morning to our guests. The implementation plan for the Scottish National Investment Bank uh, says that when decisions on investments <coughs> are being made, that there needs to also be that broader approach of taking into account uh, economic, social and environmental factors as well as uh, commercial ones. So I just wondered if we could start by um, hearing about how the Scottish Investment Bank just now <coughs> takes that approach or not, you know, what attempts are made to have a, a balance between um, commercial uh, factors and uh, other aspects when measuring performance. So we absolutely do. We look at it at lots of different levels. So as I kind of briefly touched on earlier, the market from the uh, risk capital side is something that we've been looking to to grow uh, for a number of years and, and, and quite successfully. Uh, it's now performing um, at the best regionally across the UK. Uh, so Scotland's punching at uh, or above its weight uh, on the early stage side. So, so that is something that we monitor closely, both the size of the overall deal, but we also strip out the the high deals, sort of over 10 million sort of outliers to see the underlying market to make sure that it's still healthy um, and it is still healthy and still growing. Uh, so that's one element we look at. Um, we also do evaluations, which, um, you know, to the previous question, is really important from the point of view of the role that we play in the market. The evaluations are both qualitative and quantitative. They look to try and work out um, a GVA impact in jobs and various other elements, which are obviously important for an economic development agency. They also speak to investors and companies and other market players to ask the questions about the role that we've played in the market, whether we've filled gaps, whether we've been additional and those sort of things. And that allows us then to uh, to look at the success of the fund, whether they've delivered what we'd like them to deliver in the market, whether there's improvements that we can make, and whether they're fit for purpose, and whether any uh, changes need to be made to make them more relevant and more useful uh, to the market. And then the other level is the, the financial performance, which we touched on earlier. Um, so we, we don't have a, a target rate of return, but we do have to act commercially. So we're seeking to, to maximise the returns that we can. So it's important for us to, uh, to monitor the income that we're bringing in from our exits and to uh, do all we can to try and maximise that. So you've um, outlined how uh, market factors and you know financial returns are evaluated, but... If, if anyone had to pick out, you know, randomly, any investment decision made just now by the Scottish Investment Bank and ask about broader social factors or environmental impact, for example, would you be able to articulate a response to, to demonstrate that and explain how it was measured? So I wouldn't be able to do that in every single one. That's work in progress for us. Um, for a number of years, we've been working closely to try and record some um, of the, the important factors, uh, women-led businesses, for example, um, and ethnic minorities. We've had um, 
a couple of challenges the GDRP that we're just kind of working through, um, but uh, we're still developing an approach to that. Overall, it's one of the things that we are um, strongly focused on as a business. The Scottish enterprise as a whole is very clear on the need to um, to record the, the social uh, factors as well as environmental factors, and we're putting in place the tools to allow us to do that consistently uh, across all of our different areas of activities and uh, right down to either company basis or a project basis. Okay, and do you just now use anything like a balanced scorecard? Um, and if you don't, would you consider that a good tool potentially for the Scottish National Investment Bank in terms of uh, measuring that broader performance that's required? Yes, so we do. We don't produce it externally, but we do do it internally. Um, we have had an annual review previously, which sets out, you know, essentially the you know the factors on the portfolio and company basis, employees uh, levels and the like. Um, but the overall market and the, the economic and the financial performance, we record that internally and essentially a balanced scorecard approach. And yes, I think that's very important for the for the bank to do that going forward. Um, I think it would not be sensible to, to focus on one of the elements and not the others. It's very important that um, there's a real focus across all the different factors that can really make a, a change to the economy. Thank you. And I'd be interested to hear about the, the experience with the Development Bank of, of Wales in terms of, again, whether or not uh, broader factors are taken into account in investment decisions and how they are therefore measured. Yeah. Uh, well, I can I could probably... the, the, the the easiest examples are probably I talked about earlier where uh, we're providing um, commercial finance alongside uh, Welsh Government grant funding and generally the mix might be up to 20% grant funding, 80% commercial finance, two separate things but working in a very, very joined, joined up way. Now we know with all of those uh, in order to uh, receive a, a government grant through uh, the Minister's Economic Action Plan, uh, uh, they, the, the companies actually have to sign up to a contract. Uh, with government, uh, which basically promotes uh, decarbonising, uh, offering uh, fair wages and fair work, and some other, some other um, things. In fact, I have them here. So it's promotion of health, including a special emphasis on mental health skills and learning in the workplace, uh, progress on reducing uh, carbon footprint, uh, fair work, um, as defined by the Fair Work Board, something very clear who does that, and growth potential. Uh, uh, so they have to be businesses uh, with growth potential. So so um, those are um, specifically measured against those by the Welsh Government and therefore our commercial finance will, will sort of flow in behind it. I suppose a se separate part is actually developing funds that specifically address some of those issues. So on the decarbonising um, uh, space, there's an awful lot we can do with modern uh, methods of manufacture, for example, in supporting businesses in the supply chain uh, um, to, to do more of that. Uh, decarbonising the existing housing stock is a massive issue, and I think it would probably be just as big an issue in Scotland as it is in Wales. Um, uh, I think the statistic is that somewhere in the order of 85% uh, of all houses that will be built in 50 years' time actually are built now. So therefore, if you don't decarbonise those, it's going to be a, a massive drag on efforts to move uh, decarbonisation decarbonization forward. So we're in discussions um, uh, with the housing department to see how we could intervene and create specific funds to... Uh, accelerate that change uh, across Wales. So we're doing it at kind of a, a number of different levels. Okay, and in terms of taking um, the balanced scoreboard approach, is that something that you would... Uh, based on your experience, support and recommend? Yes, yes, definitely. Uh, we, we have, uh, a bit like Kerry, we do operate a balanced score card from within the business where we're looking at from the customer perspective, from the finance perspective, delivery perspective, etc. So we, we have that and we operate that on a day-to-day -day basis. I think in the context of what you're saying, it's it's actually a, a more of a balanced scorecard of you've got financial returns, but what are the social economic returns? And that's something uh, we are developing this year as part of our KPI measurement, which will be in place by, uh, well, it's got to be in place this year to be reported on next year. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Convener. Jamie Halker Johnson. Uh, thank you very much indeed, and welcome to the panelists. Um, I'm looking at the regional perspective, and um, the DBW has four offices across Wales, um, and I know that the Scottish Government um, have been looking uh, at 
potential for um, physical location and physical locations and consultation work is uh, underway on that or uh, considering they're considering options so if I could ask um, Rob Hunter I suppose what the the benefits are or the pros and cons are in having those off uh, offices spread out across across Wales and across the, the regions of Wales well Sam uh, uh, I actually produced a few years ago a strategy for for location across Wales uh, the pan Wales strategy which is available on our website if you if you would want to see it um, uh, the minister was uh, extremely keen and we were extremely keen that we would be a development bank for the whole of Wales and we are um, uh, uh, we were a Cardiff centric uh, organization with a few satellites outside of Cardiff um, what we've done is uh, we've generated a HQ office in Wrexham, uh, which will have somewhere in the order of about 52 to 55 staff. Uh, we're well on track, actually, to reach that target earlier than, than we had originally uh, uh, forecast, so that's going really well. And actually, the mix between uh, Wrexham and Cardiff, Cardiff is still going to be our biggest office physically, but then the southeast of Wales is where the, the majority of the businesses are. Um, uh, if you look at the mix, it's it's been designed uh, to make sure we have a presence which is consistent with the business demography uh, in that particular region. Uh, that will drive up, I think, investment levels, and and we're already seeing that uh, in North Wales. Uh, we have uh, an office in Clenethley, which is in South West Wales. Um, we are also about to open a small office uh, uh, near Clandidno, which is uh, in North East Wales. Um, so we will have people on the ground. And I think it's really, really important because as, as the banks have sort of retrenched and moved away, and there's a thought that actually this is a new thing. The banks have retrenched and they're moving away and they're closing uh, branches so they're not as close to the businesses. But actually the business decisions have been removed from those branches probably for a very long time. Uh, most of the actual investment decisions are made remotely in, in a HQ somewhere. One of the USPs of our organisation is that we are um, a, a friendly face. We actually uh, will uh, have and we will continue um, to meet our clients face to face uh, and, and build a, a relationship with them. And I think that's uh, uh, extremely important. One of the things, we've got 22 unitary authorities in Wales, and one of the things we noticed was um, there were pockets of very low investment activity so what we did about three years ago um, we set ourselves a cart target it changes every year because the unitary authority in the bottom five will change each year but we have a specific target to uh, increase the investment in the five uh, lowest performing local authority areas by 10 percent uh, in in a year now last year combined on the five we had growth of about 64 65 percent so um, that was really positive and of course that just raises the bar and then we've got to do do more next time uh, but it is I think it's it's absolutely crucial that that it's not from our point of view in Wales uh, it's not seen as a bank for Cardiff or uh, a Cardiff-centric organisation. It's certainly not that. And uh, I think we've got very, very good reach now right across Wales. You, you, you're really testing my knowledge of uh, the geography of Wales there with, uh, with the offices. But so, so it's interesting. So you're actually, rather than focusing where the businesses necessarily are and the, and the, and the demand is, you are looking to particularly target those areas where demand needs to be, the lowest, those lowest demand and, and needs to be increased. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And I, and, I, and I think that's critical. It's very, it's very easy. I mean, any target-driven organisation, and it's, it's not an intentional thing, all, I think, when you set targets on anything, you can get um, good intended consequences and you can get unintended consequences. And an unintended consequence might be that the poorest performing regions are kind of left alone. And we can't let that happen across, you know, we, we have to make sure the reach of this organisation goes right across uh, all of the boundaries and, and it really goes back and I know there's a lot of talk about patient capital but I think it, it highlights the importance of doing those smaller value deals as well because the people need to see that the national institution is actually real and it's doing something in their area and the problem you may have if it was you know from our point of view if we were only doing large-scale patient capital the likelihood is we'd be doing the vast majority of our deals uh, in Cardiff or, or you know very close to the border with England and Wrexham. 
So, so you would be pretty clear that by having only one office, or if you only had one office, that would limit your your, your ability, your impact. I, I genuinely believe it would, and I, and I think the the, the thing it's, it's a very strange thing. I never realised it. I've been in Wales now for fifteen years, but when I first went to Wales, I allowed myself about three hours to drive from south to north Wales because I thought, well, it's it's one hundred and eighty miles. That's about three three hours. It's not. It's uh, it's actually a, a quite a journey. Um, Wales has got the uh, M4 coming across the bottom and the A55 going across the top, and then you've got roads sort of which are quite difficult to navigate to get from north to south. So therefore, to have all of your staff in South Wales would really make it feel very, very remote to the north. We've always had people based in North Wales, but I don't think we've had them at the scale uh, uh, we needed to, to 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 really demonstrate that we're on the ground and we're doing business. I, I appreciate the issues you raised, having driven from Abergavenny up to Betsy Coed not that long ago. Um, so, so on that basis, could, if you could give me your opinion, and perhaps um, Kerry Shark, you give me your thoughts as well about this this idea of having more than one office and offices uh, out and about across across uh, the regions of Scotland. Obviously, I represent the Highlands and Islands, so um, you know we we can feel a long way away from. Um, lots of parts of Scotland. So, if I could get your thoughts on that, it, it's it's if if you look at our, our um, footprint, we're going to have about um, 14 to 17 people down in Clonethly, so that's southwest Wales. About 100, 110 in Cardiff. About 50 to 55 uh, in Wrexham. Uh, for those areas which are further out, so the thing is, it could be a development bank for the whole of. East Wales, it's not, it's a development bank for the whole of Wales, so therefore uh, we do have satellite offices, smaller satellite offices in Newtown and we're going to have them in Clandidno, so we're covering off those areas which are right at the sort of more extremes of the A55 across North Wales. Uh, our staff generally from both of those offices, Wrexham and Cardiff, can reach out and, and pretty much within an hour and a half uh, get to most <coughs> businesses in, in those regions, but we do have specific offices who uh, cover any patches where there's a little bit of uh, uh, under-representation, if you like. Um, but, yeah. and, and at some point, there is the aim, the one bit which is missing is Aberystwyth, which is right in the middle of the two. And um, when, the, when we create enough demand, uh, we would be looking to base a small office there. So your suggestion would be make sure that you have uh, offices or footprints within a sort of wider... Uh, areas yeah, areas and one, one of the lessons we've learned, and I think it's this is hugely important, um, we've put telepresence into our offices. Uh, the one thing you don't want is for people to be travelling for three hours to go to a half an hour meeting. So having a state-of-the-art, not necessarily the um, gold-plated stuff, but state-of-the-art telepresence uh, and getting everyone to use it, once again, it comes down to carbon footprint and making sure we're making best use of those individuals' time. So... Um, we have put pretty much state-of-the-art um, equipment in all of our main offices. Answer yeah. right here, So I would certainly um, agree entirely with what Rob's saying. So the Scottish Investment Bank is Pan Scotland, so we operate um, across the whole um, of Scotland. Um, we have staff based in virtually all of SE's offices, which... I remember, I think it's 12. Um, we've got kind of three main hubs, Glasgow, Edinburgh and Bells Hill, where most staff are, but people are kind of far and wide. And it's really important to be close to the businesses and the advisors and the projects and the communities that we're working with. We work very closely with HI um, in particular, and we will with South, South of Scotland Agency when it's up and running. Um, and we make sure we're available from a finance point of view to interact with the companies and the account manager and, and other colleagues in HI. Um, and I agree with uh, Ross point entirely as well on the um, the uh, technology is required uh, to, to a good standard to allow you to have kind of either WebExes or um, online conference calls or, or the like to make sure we can be available um, consistently and continually. Um, how would you see that? With the new Scottish Investment Bank, how would you see that change or would you see it improve or how do you think it should, 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 should sit? So clearly the decisions to be made with the head office is going to be and where um, any actual offices will be based, but there, there's certainly the, the potential for co-location, for example, with whether it's SD or high or others. Uh, there needs to be a, a cost-effective way to ensure that the staff are getting out and about. And, you know, it seemed to Rob's point, there's no point spending all your time in the car on a train, you know, getting somewhere low carbon aside, even just from a time, you know, point of view. Um, so ideally having staff based in different locations, clearly that has a different dimension to it from the point of view of, of managing staff and matrix structures and everything else. Um, but I think it's um, really important to ensure the bank, because I think I'm sure government would say the same, as Rob said, for a way 
Wales, you know, the, the new Scottish National Investment Bank is for the whole of Scotland. And it's important that the companies have got full um, and available access to it. Just, just one point. I think it's uh, it's also really important to encourage flexible working. I mean, there is you know, the 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 idea that we have very big offices and everyone goes to those big offices at nine o'clock in the morning and comes home at five o'clock in the evening. I think is something which is changing dramatically. Uh, so therefore, what we do uh, uh, within the development bank is we encourage uh, people to work from home. So we actually have people working from home for a, a reasonable amount of their time based right across Wales. So that's, that's another resource which, which you can tap into. Once again, um, with, with excellent sort of Skype connections through uh, laptops, it's much, much easier now to actually communicate and stay in touch with people as they're working remotely. Thank you. And uh, very briefly, I hope, uh, Andy Whiteman, finally. So Yes, I just wanted to ask Mr. Cunter a question on governance. So, you're a PLC, you were established in 2000, or your predecessor was. Have your objects changed since then, are they as they were in corporation? Uh, they're pretty much as they were when okay. they were incorporated at that time. And I know th I know there is this sort of ongoing debate as to whether the organisation should or shouldn't be a PLC. Um, I, I would suggest, I think a PLC works in terms of, uh, it's a very very much a known quantity. It's got, uh, it's got a, a, a very... If I can interrupt, I'm not, I'm not no, particularly no, interested in the no. PLC. I think okay. we're, I'm interested okay. in the objects. Yes. Um, so chapter two of the of the bill has the statutory objects for the Scottish National Investment Bank, which you probably have not had a time to look at. But if you if you have any comments on those, certainly welcome them. And the second, just I'm being encouraged to be brief. I apologise. Second uh, question is who is the shareholder of the Development Bank of Wales? It's Welsh ministers, and I think one share is with our CEO. With your CEO. Yes. Okay. So one thank share, you. They are the majority. Great. Thanks. Thank you. You can submit additional comments in writing after, after the session, so uh, don't hesitate to do so. Um, I think that's all the time we have now here, though, uh, this morning. So thank you very much for coming in. I'll um, suspend the meeting and we'll move into private session now. Thank you.